Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Welcome to our online ornamental uh, network launch with Tubby Camry this afternoon. I'm Alice Coleman, I'm the project manager for, um, I'm sorry, I'm the project officer for Tubby Camry and I'm also joined by the project manager from Tubby Camry, Sarah Gould. Um, Sarah will also be facilitating the session today. We're so pleased to have David Talbot with us. David Talbot's um, from ADAS and he's going to do a short webinar on integrated pest management today. Um, the first slide that you'll see is on housekeeping, just to um, make sure that we're all happy and, and going forward. All attendees are muted and your camera will be off, so we can't see or hear you. Um, today is, is purely a webinar. If you have any Q&As, which we do welcome, welcome Q&As through the session, if you use the um, box, there should be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your mouse, you should see a Q&A box. And then next door to the Q&A box, you'll see a chat box, which you can use this chat box just to chat with other participants, or if you want to ask uh, panelists Sarah and I, or David, um, flag up any information to us, you can talk to us through there. But the Q&As will be read out regularly and Sarah will facilitate that. Um, we are recording the session, we'll be posting it on our Knowledge Hub after the webinar, so it's free access to anybody who wants to go back into the Tubby Cymru Knowledge Hub and you can play the whole webinar again if you wish to. If you accidentally leave or if your Wi-Fi cuts out, you can rejoin the webinar using exactly the same link. Before I hand over to David, I just wanted to highlight what we do as a project. Tevi Cymru support uh, commercial horticultural businesses in Wales through 100% funded training and development. So if you want to know any more about the project, um, or if you have questions, or you want to know more about the network, but certainly the ornamental network, pop, um, there'll be details in the chat box. So you'll see our website, tevicumry.co.uk, and perhaps you can email us as well. And just if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer those. Um, Eligible businesses joining the network will have access to all a whole raft of things, to technical advice, events, online forums, and we've got resources available through the Knowledge Hub and of course through peer support, we will be encouraging that. So enough, enough of all the detail, I'll hand over to David. Um, we're really pleased to have David with us. He's a horticulture consultant from ADAS, specialising in all aspects of ornamental crop production and works with a range of commercial growers in the hardy nursery stock bedding and pot plant sector. So I think it's over to you, David. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Alice. Welcome, everyone. Right, so integrated pest management. <coughs> so just a bit of background about myself. I'm a horticulture consultant. I've worked with ADAS for 13 years. Um, and my day-to-day -day work, I carry out a mixture of applied research and grower consultancy, focusing really on pest disease and weed control, all within ornamental crops. And that mixture of work seems to work really well because it enables me to apply new, new things that we're finding out from the research directly into the grower advice and helps to keep people up to date. Um, things are constantly changing, particularly with regard to pesticides, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, if people want to put what you're growing in the chat box, that might be useful, um, but don't feel you have. So, kicking off, maintaining plant quality during summer. More plants are killed on nursery through overly wet conditions, so wherever you can, maintain a drier regime will definitely help. It keeps down a range of foliar diseases and also root pathogens such as Pythiums, Phytophthora, which thrive in wet conditions. At this time of year, growth can be very rapid, particularly under protection. So if you're potting liners um, and you've got space outside, it's often a good tactic to pot those outside at this time of year. That can save you a lot of work if they say herbaceous, um, cutting back, etc. Um, and it gives you more slow, slower toned growth and can reduce stress on stress on. A range of crops particularly when we're going into hot conditions as a forecast this week which can stress the crop and trigger trigger root pathogens and other problems. Shading is also useful to slow growth help keep the temperature down reduce scorch 
and just reduce the stress on crops under protection. Uh, plant growth regulator is another tool to use, uh, particularly under protection, saving on cutting back and maintaining plant quality. Uh, one of the main ones is bonsai paclobutrazole, which we be using particularly under glass houses. It's only under permanent protection glass houses, that one, um, but it's very useful in ornamentals. Widely used in bedding, and more recently, people are using it in nursery stock, but at much higher rates than bedding. So you're typically looking at sort of five mil per litre to apply in nursery stock to give you the growth control that you need. So thinking about some of the key problems at this time of year, we're well and truly into two spotted mite season, one of the major foliar pests of nursery stock um, and just how we deal with this pest. So integrated pest management is really the way forward and this is using various tools to manage the pest population within the crop. So not just relying on sprays, we're using predators, any cultural controls that are applicable to manage the, the pest within the crop. Um, just to give a bit of background, there are less and less of caricides for use of, to take out this pest. Um, the main one we have is Dynamec, and that is now restricted to just use under permanent protection. Protection, so glass houses. Uh, so more, people have kind of been pushed into IPM if they weren't already doing it because there are less effective controls available these days. So thinking about the predators we're using for this pest, the main one is Phytocinus personalis, um, supplied by various companies and it, they all have a product name for it so it can get a little bit confusing but it's a specialist predator, it only predates on two spotted spider mites and it can give very rapid knockdown of the pest. So typical approach is to introduce it weekly um, before you start to see the pest from about April typically and rates can vary and you need to tweak the rates in line with pest pressure so the rate can be anything from 2 to sort of 20 per square meter depending on what's going on within the crop and how you decide on the rate to use is by carrying out weekly crop walks closely monitoring the crop and seeing the pest to predator ratio. And there's a sort of magic ratio of one predator to 10 spider mice. And when you've got that ratio, you can be confident that they will achieve control. And you can tweak your introduction rates weekly in response to the population. There's also some <coughs> limitations with a predator when it gets very hot and dry can struggle a little bit sometimes it goes down into the canopy of the crop so there's a few techniques to address this um, damping down paths might help but depending on your crop you might not want humidity because that could cause other problems like downy mildew so people often put another predator in called uh, neocelius which used to be amblyceus californicus and that predator can cope with hotter, drier conditions. It's more of a generalist, so it can survive in the absence of the pest, and it will feed on various other things, including pollen, if there is any in the crop. And it's, it's useful because it gives you a bit of a buffer if you do get a very hot period when your phytocellulis don't perform as well. So we've got these predators. If things get out of control, what do we do? Um, can and people successfully do use phytocellus as a knockdown treatment at up to 50 per square meter. Um, that can get a bit expensive, it depends where you are in the crop um, and, and what you've done previously. So there are options to do that and it can work very quickly and very well. Alternatively, people might choose to use a knockdown insecticide. So we talked about Dynamec earlier, um, which is quite well known. It has its own limitations in that one breaks down the bright sunlight so you don't want to be applying it in the heat of the day or in bright conditions ideally late in the evening that doesn't always work with nursery working practices um, just with dynamic it will only take the adults so it won't kill any eggs that are there which there will be eggs so if you haven't got a good 
all you have. So with those eggs, you need to either go in with another spray of Dynamic or you can tank mix that product with another thing called Borneo, which is another acaricide. Borneo is one that takes out the eggs, so the two products work. One takes the eggs, one takes the adults to give you a knockdown or a wipeout prior to going back in with your predators. There are other physical products, um, such as Majestic Eredicote, but you need to make contact with a pest to achieve control. And because it dwells on the underside of the leaf, it's not always easy to make spray co contact with pests on the underside of a leaf. So, talked about a couple of products, but you might have something you're thinking about using that we haven't mentioned. So, how to find out if these are compatible with predators. Most of the biocontrol companies' websites have crop safety well, predator safety checking tools. So the BioBest website, for instance, has one. Um, the Copper website has one. You'll normally need to know the active rather than the product name. So Dynamic, the active, Abamectin, you punch that in, and then the predator you're using or interesting in preserving. And it will give you a effect on the predator of that insecticide. So it might say it'll possibly take out 25% of the population and then it's up to you to weigh that up as to, to whether you go with it. So they're useful tools and also worth mentioning it's useful thinking about any fungicides you're using because they can also have an effect um, particularly things like tubal gold so the fungicides will all be list listed on there as well so again it's by active ingredient rather than product name. Okay moving on. So aphid control, again, we haven't got many products these days, so more and more people are using integrated pest management. Um, there are a few non-integrated pest management solutions that people use. So these are the older products, things like desis that will kill aphids. Um, they don't kill all species. There are some species that are resistant to them. But those sorts of products, if you use them in an integrated pest management system where you're using predators, they can leave strong persistent residues that persist for up to three months that can really disrupt and prevent your predators from working as they should. So they're best steered clear of where you're using predators. So typically people under protection are using aphidias, which are parasitic wasps, and again, you put those in from early season, set rate per, per square meter, and putting them in before the aphids become a problem. Um, they're far better scouts than any of us are, and they go and lay an egg inside the aphid, which then hatches out as another parasitic wasp, and the cycle goes on. But you do need to keep putting those in weekly. Uh, as I said, we've got limited spray options, so. Uh, we've got things like main man we've got three applications of that uh, we can use things like AFOX, but only once a year um, so there aren't that many options other things that we can also use are things like gazelle but some people's customers are not wanting them to use any near nicotinoid insecticides so that might take that one out of the equation for you so when you've got aphids and you've got a big population you really need to put a safe knockdown treatment on prior to, to deciding to use parasitic wasps or if the parasitic wasps haven't coped so some of those products I mentioned will do that <coughs> um, just an aside point I was out in on a nursery the other day and nettles are a very good reservoir for predators and these nettles um, they have a specific species of aphid to them, so that aphid won't get on your crops. You don't need to worry about that, and predators breed up very well on those. So if you have got any nettles around the nursery, they're often a good refuge for predators. So again, finding out if insecticides are compatible and safe with these predators, the same checking tools can be used on copper and biovest and other suppliers of biological controls websites. <laughs> so moving on to disease control, um, scab and powdery mildew pressure um, is about at this time of year. 
keeping the foliage as dry as we can is always very useful. Um, it, so watering early in the day in the morning helps to keep that disease pressure down, get the leaf dry as quickly as you can, ensure crops under protection are well spaced, um, but you've got plenty of ventilation, fans if possible, and ideally fans with humidistats that kick in when humidity is high and help to disperse that. So these are all useful cultural controls that we can use to limit the effects of these pathogens. <coughs> so fungicides for scab are important this time of year, so things like pyrocanthus, we've had some quite showery weather of late, and if we're not proactive with our fungicides program for, for scab, um, things like pyrocanthus can get scab on the berries, reducing the berry set, which obviously reduces the crop's marketability in the, in the autumn. And other things like fatinia can get scab on the new, new growth as well. So various products for that, um, Amistar is one, Ascala, so useful to have a programme in place for scab control in relation to, to the weather really. So when it's showery and wet, you need to be spraying more. So fungicides for powdery mildew, again, need a program in place for those, to keep those at bay. So various products, um, Amistar and Signum, they're quite closely related. So if you are using those two in a program, they need to be split up with other things. And there are softer products these days, like potassium bicarbonate, which is a, a radicant product, and that will take out any disease that you've got. There's more and more interest in using bioprotectants. So these are more natural type products, but they are actually registered as pesticides and they, they work by outcompeting the pathogen for space on the leaf. And you typically get those into your spray programs early in the season before disease pressure gets too high. And uh, nurseries that are doing this are finding they're working very well. Again, they're kind of being forced into it because we've got less and less products to make a robust program that lasts the whole season. But again, they're, they're working well. So we control. Cultural techniques are very important. So keeping the nursery clean is the, the key thing, really. So controlling any weeds on non-cropped areas. Um, roadways you don't want weeds flowering setting seed and blowing into production areas from these sorts of area and i know some nurseries are really struggling with at the moment because they've been under pressure with reduced staffing and all the challenges that covid 19 has posed this spring um, so in container production we need to be keeping those non-cropped areas clean there are useful residual herbicides that we can use um, one, for instance, is called Shikara that we can use early in the year and that will give us about five months residual control. So have it, using these sorts of products help keep the areas clean. They save a lot of regular spraying with contact herbicides and we haven't got that many contact herbicides, robust contact herbicides, well certainly not as many as we did. Um, so we've got glyphosate, which is a good product. Um, but you've got to be careful using it around crops. Any drift will cause long and lasting damage, particularly on any plants within the rosaceae family. So things like toniaster, um, apples, roses. Um, so if you're growing those, that takes that one out. Um, other things we've got include shark, a contact herbicide, but like most of the contact herbicides we have these days they have limitations so shark isn't that good on ground salt or grasses and ground salt is a common nursery weed so there are other things to use things like uh, calcium gold and um, phenalisan which are based on pelagonic acid now these have slightly more challenges because they have have conditions that are required to make them work well so the temperature needs to be above 15 degrees really um, weeds need to be actively growing so they may not work as you'd like in very dry conditions so any residual herbicides like shikara i mentioned that you can put on that keep you clean 
early in the year will really help and reduce the amount of contact herbicides you're going to have to use. Various contact herbicides to use over the crop less than we had years ago. Um, Flex is one that's widely used on in shrub production. Um, we are limited to one application per crop now. We've had Defranol come back um, but with the caveat that it can only be put put on between the 1st of November and the end of February. So it doesn't get any easier. Um, residual herbicide top ups in field production. So in field production, residual herbicides are normally put on post planting, depending on the crop. Um, newish herbicide we've had come through, well, new to our sector through EMU, um, is a product called Syncorex, uh, which was Syncorex Flow, which was has been widely used in potatoes for a long time. It's a very good herbicide, um, can be a bit hot, so you need to be sure it's safe for the crop that you're interested in using it on. Um, residual herbicides typically last about three months, so for field planting, they'll be fizzling out about now, depending on when you put them on. So there's uh, top-up options to put on. So Back in May, there's the option of dual gold, that's a bit academic because May is gone. Uh, but there are products like Fornet 6OD, which we can use <coughs> between up, well up to middle of June. The main thing with re residual herbicides, if you are a bit wary of the crop safety or unsure, you can always put them on as an inter-row treatment. So there's that option. Um, and they obviously work better in moist conditions. So moving on to <coughs> crop nutrition. I've been working on a, a project on crop nutrition recently, and just really one of the key things from the project is flagged up the importance of soil analysis for field production and regular soil analysis. About every three years is enough for field production, typically before you plant, and that you'll send it off to the lab, um, somewhere like natural resource management, but we can help you with that if you need it. And um, they'll give you an analysis back and that'll give you what we call indexes for the key nutrients, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. And then we need to relate those results back to any application rates. So if, if you've got good indices of potassium, magnesium, phosphates typically between two and three you may not need to put any on you probably won't need to put any on and that can result in big savings in fertilizers um, ph optimum is about six to six point five for field grown production so the soil analysis will tell you your ph and whether there's any need to put any lime on and just another thing about Nitrogen, um, we've got restrictions on its use these days in many, much of a country in what we call nitrogen vulnerable zones, which limits the amount we can apply. But nitrogen is readily leached. So one of the key things with nitrogen is if you can put it on little and often, you'll get far better results, lose less through leaching, which will have less environmental impacts and give you more bang for your buck. So um, typically sort of three dressings at 50 kilograms per hectare if needed for the crop for field grown nursery stock works well. So any questions, if you can post those through the chat box and we'll go from there. Hi David, I don't think there's any Q and A's yet. So if anybody's got a burning question, please, if you hover your mouse, you'll see the Q and A box at the bottom. Oh, we've got one now. We've we've got one from Callum Johnston. Um, I grow pot herbs and perennials. My customers are strongly against conventional chemicals. Is it possible to say anything more about the effectiveness of biological agents, particularly leaf spot diseases and downy mildew? Yeah. So the beauty of the more biological products called bioprotectants, they tend to have a very wide spectrum. Um, so we've got Things like Serenade ASO, um, Amylo X, and they're, 
basically strains of bacillus, good bacillus, and they have, as I say, wide, wide range of activity really. So, um, for instance, serenade, its main use is botrytis, but it also has effects against uh, about powdery mildew, um, leaf spots, so they cover a lot of things. Um, Amylox is even said to have an effect against downy mildew, um, and I've been using these sorts of products in programs, even on crops such as roses that are very prone to rust. And although they may not have rust in the, the, the spectrum of activity, they certainly seem to suppress it. So they they use the products. Um, the main thing with them, you need to get them on when the crops clean before you get a problem. Um, and that's the, the key to success with them, really. And they help keep the crop healthy and yeah, work well. You probably will need to integrate some fungicides, but things like Karma I talked about, for, which is a registered form of potassium bicarbonate, which is something that will kill any powdery mildew, it won't give you any protection against it, but it will kill it. Um, that is formulated with wetters. You can just use food grade potassium bicarbonate but it's not formulated with wetters, um, so it's it's up to you. But uh, yeah, there are quite a few useful products out there, and the direction of travel is more biopesticides coming through. I think in the USA they've got something like 150 products with lagging behind them massively. But in the next few years, that's the way everything's going, and more will come through. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Any, uh, any other questions? That, um, that does remind me for Callum and, and anyone else who's interested, what we can offer as part of the Tuvy Cymru programme is one-to-one -one advice um, from, from the likes of David and we've got Chris with us today as well. Uh, so if you're interested in that, email us um, the the application process is to make sure that you've completed the online business review, um, but then we can put you in touch with those guys and you can t continue that conversation on specific advice if you want to. Um, so that that's available for anybody signed up to the program. That was really an excellent presentation. Thank you very much, David, for that. I don't Pleasure. think... I don't think we've got any more questions. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and we will have more of the um, ornamental um, webinars in the future. So look out for the dates. Um, they're all on our e-bulletin and you should have received our webinar email um, in the last few days to show what's available throughout the program. Um, what will happen when you leave is you will get a feedback form. Please do answer that. It, it doesn't take too long and it really helps us with forming the program going forward just to see whether this has been useful and whether there's any other areas that you would like us to explore. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again, David. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.